Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to San Francisco. Welcome to Swag Spring. Welcome to Site Operations. Here we are. Another year, another year, another year. And it's good to be back together. So we're going to get started here in about two seconds. I want to welcome everyone in person. This is so good to be together. And welcome those online too, especially those of you on the East Coast who are way past your bedtime already and hanging out with us until all hours of the night. Thank you. We're going to get started. We have a very full agenda tonight. We are asking everyone to keep their phones on mute just so we don't have distractions and to help with sound quality. If you have questions, um, especially for those of you online, you can still be with us here. Use your chat icon to submit them and we'll try to present them to the speakers during the meeting. The presentation should be posted in a few weeks after too. So if there are key segments that you think, oh, I need those slides, they're gonna turn up. You don't have to furiously write notes tonight. We want you to enjoy, listen, savor, learn, share, just be. Our agenda tonight, I'm going the wrong direction here. <laughs> here we go. So we're gonna open and this is our agenda. You have a beautiful copy in front of you. Courtney Willie made us a very special version with the Golden Gate Bridge on it. And I wanna point that out, especially because that will become your record of attendance. So if you need something for SOCRA or ACRP to say that you attended the meeting, save your agenda and at the bottom, you can fill in how long you were here with us and this will be your record for the future. You are the ORP committee, and we just want to highlight that SWAG has, um, in the past, there were separate committees for CRAs and nurses, and some time ago, we all became one and were called oncology research professionals. Alliance refers to us as clinical research professionals, and we're thinking we should morph the two together and be called the oncology clinical research professionals or something, but the acronyms mean us and we and you and all of us together. This is your committee. You play a, a, an important role in all that SWAG does and that's recognized by leadership. This is our committee. Just so you recognize that, we have more than 10,000 members of the committee now in this category of people. So you're not alone. We do have some new members of our executive committee that I wanna highlight. Jamie Myers has been with us for a number of years with nursing research and they're strong and going forward. On ORP liaison, we have co-chair Sandy Annis and then Erin Sebula who joined us recently. She's a new executive committee member. Membership is led by Anthony Hicks and Lisa Stoppenhagen. Education co-chairs are Deb Bergevin and Joyce Tull and I wanna issue a special round of thanks to them for all the hard work leading the education committee to get this spring meeting put together through thick and thin. And then our site operations committee, I'm here with my co-chairs, Liz Edwards and Caitlin Hutchinson. To get more deeply involved in the ORP committee, there's a way that you can let us know that you're interested in a committee on the website. And this will be in your slides, but if you look on the SWAG website under member resources and membership, you'll see a link that will come to us and we'll get back with you and see what you feel would be the best fit, but we always have openings always have room for people to get more deeply engaged. I also wanna to highlight tomorrow. Tomorrow's our really capstone key day for ORP. And so make sure you come by the Jerry and Noboro Oishi Symposium. It's gonna be especially fun, especially unique session, one that we've never done before, talking about what makes it all tick beyond what you see on the surface from start of an idea all the way through protocol development and the reality of implementing with a really fun and special twist of the Wizard of Oz. So come by tomorrow morning and then the afternoon is your time to really meet and greet and network with others, learn all that you can in our open forum session. And this is our first time returning to open forum in person. So come with your questions, come with your ideas and hang out for a bit in the afternoon with us. To kick us off tonight, I've asked Jennifer Dill to join me here. I know I saw her. Jen, if you could come up and join me. We're gonna share with you some information about some work that's been going on <clears throat> with our ORP and CRP committees. Jen is my counterpart with the Alliance Committee, um, the CRP Committee, and we've worked together and a lot of you have helped us with this on a group that we'll talk about, but also even by making your voice heard and giving some feedback. Some of you may re remember some surveys that came out last winter. It's been a little over a year ago that we got together and did some work based on the fact we were all drowning. 
We knew that we were sinking. We were individually sinking. We didn't talk about it because we thought, geez, am I the only one struggling with this? And lo and behold, as we began to talk, we realized everybody was really struggling with staffing changes, workload issues, things that maybe had been problems all along, but really were bubbling up during COVID. And so by hanging out and talking in a hallway mode, we put a group together, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. About the same time, SWAG also surveyed our head CRA distribution list. And I just want to point that out because I don't know that we've ever shared this officially here, but this is your input and it's very small, but it will be in the slides. It was published as an abstract and a poster at ASCO last year. This is the feedback that you gave. Over 80% of sites experienced significant staffing turnovers and attrition changes. So if you have a chance, take a look at that poster. At the same time we were working on that, there's a group of people that rolled up their sleeves and said, how can we help? And these are some of those folks. And many of them you'll see in this room tonight. Some of them may be colleagues and friends that you've met over the years in other groups. I see Amanda here. Others, anybody else on ROI, can you raise your hand? Maggie's here. Liz is here. Others are here. So anyway, lots of hands at the wheel on this one. We just wanted to see what, what's the truth of it all. So we got people together and created a survey to find out what were site's most pressing issues in the following categories, regulatory, administration, clinical coordination, data coordination, study activation, and remote audits. The survey went out to the Alliance and the Energy membership distribution list, and then it was also posted on CTSU. And I know a number of you at the site level responded to this. This may be one of the most important things that we have done in this decade, honestly and truly, and you'll see why as we go through this and Jen shares with you some of what's happened recently. So literally there was a call to action with people saying, we're drowning, what can we do? First, we were just drowning and panicking. Then we were freaking out and then we were feeling terrible and miserable and really kind of overwhelmed. But I think the secret was realizing that lots of us were experiencing challenges. We got together and started working and this is what happened. The survey was developed first quarter 2022, and then it went out in quarter two. So that wasn't that long ago, less than a year ago. We got 566 responses and over 800 free text comments. And some very clear themes jumped out in the middle of all that data. They were that the lack of clarity in protocols and data submission instructions were really challenging. Inefficiencies in trial activation and duplicative work were really hard. The volume of complexity and required data, high staff turnover and subsequent onboarding of new staff and inefficiencies from inaccurate reports like our DQP and open funding reports were really creating enormous burden on site staff. And it was really difficult to find our way through it all. So our working group came up with some goals. At first we wanted to solve everything. We knew we had lots of things to work on, but where did we begin? So we narrowed it down to a couple of key things, but we wanted to really start by looking at things that were doable, things that were feasible. How could we improve efficiencies? Because if we were better, everybody would be better. And we wanted to look beyond our individual sites, look collectively at sites in general, but also the research enterprise. How can we help everybody get better? We identify, wanted to identify ways to work together across the NCTN and NCORE enterprise. It wasn't just one aspect of us that was in trouble. We were all struggling. And then we wanted to decrease site research staff turnover through improved job satisfaction and improved clinical trial accessibility for rural and underserved populations. So these are the 10 opportunities. And Jen, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, Connie. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here, so thank you. Um, as Connie mentioned, we kind of highlighted our top 10 requests um, and presented these to the NCTN. I'll give you that timeline in a minute here, but. The top 10 challenges we, or opportunities we found were um, improving the clarity of protocols and case report forms, reducing data collection, and really just being more intentional about what data is being collected, clearly label FDA registration trials, streamline regulatory and rostering processes, increasing audit consistency between the research bases, developing a master DTL, improving CTSU report accuracy, improving clinical trial accessibility for underserved populations, 
to provide a protocol specific EMR treatment plan and to centralize CRP training. So obviously these are a lot of really big goals. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of shooting for the stars here. And so what happened is, you know, we, as Connie said, we gave a call to action. Um, the survey went out and last Last fall, uh, the NCTN leadership invited us to present our data to uh, the NCTN leadership, which is the group chairs and a lot of the staff from the from the groups, along with the NCI. And this is the list that we had given them, and it was just has been really encouraging. Um, that spurred on presenting more of this data to CTAC, um, to different groups um, and leadership, and we've really found some great collaboration from the groups and CTSU and the NCI with many of these projects. Um, so the timing, no, yeah, you're going to go. No, you go. Well, we, we just keep marveling at the speed at which this is moving. It's kind of like an unexpected surprise. We're not used to this. People really want to know what you think, what we think, what we, what we hope will make life better. And so I think we should just probably make posters and buttons and plaques on the wall because things have moved so quickly, like nothing we've ever seen in our historical evolution as CRAs and nurses and ORPs and CRPs. But a lot of people are really interested in this. And I think it's all timing. If we had done the same survey two or three years ago, we might not have had the same response. Two or three years from now, everybody's going to be tired of hearing about all the drama and the challenges and think we're through the other side because the pandemic's over. So, you know, whatever. But really, I think we've really, it, we just found the sweet spot and your opinion really mattered. Your voices have really been heard. And so as Jen's going to share, some really powerful things have been happening. We haven't even had to go out and look for them. We, we had this list of people to start calling and places to begin sharing and thought we'd have to struggle to get the word out. And we've barely been able to keep up with the phone calls and invitations. So all I can say is sometimes the stars, moon and sun and planets align and you just get lucky. And that's kind of what happened for all of us, I think. So keep going, Jen. All right. Um, so I'm going to back up and just give a little more full picture of the timeline here. You know, in September or in the summer 2022 is when we first started giving this information to the groups. Um, they passed along to NCTN leadership and NCOR leadership. Um, and that's where it really kept moving from there. Um, one thing I want to, a couple of things I'm going to highlight, um, but one, this last, this last um, item on the timeline is that one of our requests was that protocol specific um, EMR treatment plans would be required for protocols. And that was was implemented by the NCI as of March of this year. Those are now going to be required. Um, so the groups, it's only for new studies, the groups are starting to roll those out. So you'll see those um, on CTSU for the new protocols. CTAC also submitted um, and got approval for a recommendation for streamlining data collection. This is for phase two and three IND exempt studies. So not for all studies, but I have a link here to that document. It's about nine pages long with the recommendations to really, um, to really, uh, you know, be intentional about what data is being collected. So as Connie mentioned, this has moved faster than we ever could have hoped or dreamt. And this is the status of um, those 10 recommendations that were just, you know, presented in September of last year. Many of them are moving forward. And so I think moving forward, you know, how do we work together in a way to get, you know, at the sites, you guys are the experts of implementing these protocols. How do we get that information um, to the other entities involved? How do we work together um, and get information, you know, information and feedback from each other so that we create protocols um, and systems that are more feasible for site operations? And so I think. So we're going to segue next directly to um, Andrea Denikoff, who's been one of the chief respondents to our survey. Thanks to her, I think our voices have been very heard. 
And so she works with Dr. Meg Mooney and with Dr. Doris Shaw and others in CTEP. And Andrea is here on the line with us tonight, joining us. And so you're going to hear some more from Andrea. And then at the end, if there's time, we'd like to have discussion with Jen, Andrea, and I, and any questions you may have or other ideas or observations or input. So Andrea, are you on with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? We can. Take it away. All right. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person, but glad I can be with you virtually. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. And, and um, thanks for all the incredible work all of you do all the time. And um, so we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to share some uh, key points from a, um, a recent uh talk Dr. Jim Dorishow gave to the National Cancer Advisory Board in uh, February of 2023. And um, of course, I think what I'm going to be saying is, is already been said by Jen and Connie, but then I'll just be reiterating how important these things are and give you a few updates from CTEP. So the next slide is, I think, is the, um, is, uh, Dr. Jim Dorishow's opening slide. And as Connie said, you'll, you'll have copies of these and there's a hyperlink to the full deck if you wanna look at the full deck. But he really, um, what he spoke about, um, and not only is he the um, head of the, uh, he's the deputy director at NCI for clinical research. He's also the division director of uh, cancer treatment and diagnosis. And um, so the talk that he gave really, talked about some of the things, the survey that you all participated in about how there's a, uh, a changed clinical research environment and we need to adapt our system to it. So on the next slide, um, one of the slides he showed was enrollment to uh, the NCI designated cancer centers. And they, they picked that because that's a um, easy subset to get from um, the clinical trials reporting program. And each of these Stacked bars represents a year going from 2019 to 2022. And as you can see in 2019, um, it's a nice tall stack bar. And then in 2020 with the uh, COVID um, pandemic that you can see the big drop in accrual. And then in 2021, there was um, somewhat of a recovery, but then in 2022, it dips down again. And you can see where it dips down is in the light green type of trials, which is the institutional or, or cancer center trials. And um, cancer centers were very concerned about that in particular, that their own trials were hurting. Um, so they wanted to have a survey of at least the cancer centers to find out what was going on. So on the next slide, um, I think I have a response from one of the questions they asked, which was, for the impacts of the COVID pandemic, how did what were the what were the major impactors to your clinical trial capacity? And I think if you hit the the button one more time, it shows the outlines. I've outlined in red the two top um, reasons that were surveyed: that the limited research staff capacity prevented opening of new trials, and also the limited research staff capacity forces accrual holds. And this this. This has been a huge topic of discussion. So uh, it's consistent with all your findings at your sites and your survey. But the fact that you know this really got national attention that limited research staff capacity, there, there just wasn't the staff. You, you all said you were drowning and they heard you. And it was really a concern that this was having a major impact across the country at all of our centers. Um, so, and then on the next slide, they wanted to know the reasons for the staff attrition. You know, where 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 was everybody going? And so, in the survey, um, they found that uh, people were leaving for higher pay or career advancement, greater ability to work remotely, and also there was a significant amount of burnout from being frontline workers in the pandemic. And this also generated a lot of discussion about you know how can we. Um, uh, how can we better serve our clinical trials operations staff, um, recruit better, um, as well as maintain and um, uh, have some sort of track record for keeping staff and not losing them. Next slide. 
So all this sort of really had an impact on what uh, NCI leadership and the Clinical Trials and Translational Research Advisory Committee, or CTAC. And CTAC is, is a federal committee, if you're not familiar with it, who pro provides advice to the NCI and really uh, has a lot of influence on um, uh, particular areas for clinical research at the NCI. So uh, members of CTEC formed a strategic planning working group and developed a report for a vision of 2030. And really all of these surveys really impacted on this vision for clinical trials of the future. Next slide. So um, the strategic planning working group um, sort of reassessed what their strategic vision was going to be, mostly because of all of this information coming out um, from surveys and from the impact of the COVID pandemic. And what they uh, did was they developed 15 recommendations um, and three operational initiatives. And they were really focused on these eight themes on the right-hand side. And I'm sure many of these ring out true to you all from trial complexity and cost, um, uh, wanting to have new data collection approaches, considering the operational burdens, and really how do we outreach and do better training for uh, a new workforce that we really need to keep and maintain. And the reason I've circled um, decentralized trial activities, because that was one thing that we heard loud and clear from the surveys that you all participated in, um, but as well as other surveys, that the decentralized trial activities or protocol flexibilities that were done during COVID really wanted, uh, we heard loud and clear that they should be continued. So I think that's my last slide of Jim Dorshaw slides. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think now I'm gonna just provide a few updates from CTEP, which I think Connie and, and um, Jen have already provided. But um, in terms of decentralized trial activities, based on both the feedback from the surveys as well as CTAC's Streamlining Clinical Trials Working Group report on um, decentralizing trial activities. Um, we're, we've put together an NCTN working group that will develop standard language to use in NCTN protocols. And a shout out to Dana Sparks if she's there for, for um, uh, being, being a helpful um, voice to encourage this to happen across the NCTN. And, I've already put Jen and Connie on this committee so they can have a voice and bring your voice there. And our first meeting is scheduled. I think it's at the end of this month. Um, so hopefully uh, there'll be some alignment of language that will fit within FDA and OHRP regulations. So when protocol has these flexibilities, such as uh, whether it's using local labs and imaging studies or local healthcare providers. I mean, we've all used these things in the past, but to have standard language uh, in protocols, I think will make everyone um, feel a little bit more secure in doing some of these things and especially at audit time as well. Next slide. Um, this was already mentioned, but uh, the EMR template expansion has happened as of March 13th, 2023. And really, your survey uh, really made this happen. Uh, we had to uh, go to leadership and make sure we had the staffing to do this, um, because this, as as you all know, this takes site um, time. But but you all had some data actually within your survey, as well as we had some sites that provided us with the amount of hours it takes to build each site to build an EMR, and it was um, shared with NCI leadership so that we could. Uh, um, get TSU to build these templates. And also we do need um, our group colleagues to uh, give a final review um, because there are sort of the last experts or, or the final reviewers of these. So we make sure that the um, EMR templates are exactly per the protocol and they will be um, updated with amendments as we know sometimes amendments will change them. And, and the screenshot I have just shows the um, combo match swab protocol that um, the EMR templates um, that I've just circled, that it tells you where to find the EMR templates if you're not used to looking for them. So I, I do give credit to um, all of you for, for making this happen. Next slide. 
um, another another uh, flexibility that happened during the pandemic that was very helpful, especially to our rural sites, was the shipment of oral IND agents. And we actually provided some funding for the containers to send them. And so based on the positive feedback, again, that we've received from all of you, um, and also from sites telling us about their patients that lived a distance from the sites, um, this is now a permanent um, policy. And I believe this month, the CTSU now on their um, open funding now has a separate page for them. So I think it should be a little bit easier to um, uh, check off the funding to get uh, shipping containers for the, um, or to pay for the um, shipping containers to send uh, oral agents to patients. So hopefully this will be a continued benefit for your patients um, that live a distance from the trial site. Next slide. Um, remote consent is also the, the use of that during the pandemic. Um, we received a lot of feedback. This was a positive benefit both to sites working remotely as well as patients. And um, uh, after I already sent these slides in, the CRB has already updated their guidance. Um, so this is a permanent option. And I think probably many of you have seen this email already about this, but so I'm really excited that this has um, happened and will continue as a permanent um, way to do consent when, it's, when it makes it easier for you all. And the next slide. So I, I won't read this um, busy slide to you, but just to take the time to say that, um, and Jen and Connie already have, that the um, CRP survey actually get, provided a lot of feedback um, about uh, revisions that would be helpful to sites. And um, the audit uh, leadership of all from the CRP survey, and I think it, you know, listening in on those um, phone calls uh, with the groups and all the audit uh, chairs, you know, I, I really think you made a big impact on them. And I think the idea of clarifying more things across the guidelines and having greater consistency was really heard. So again, kudos to all of you for, for the work that you're doing. And I think that was my last slide. The one thing I will say is actually today, I was on the first phone call of the Streamlining Data Elements Committee. Um, and I'm lucky enough to co-chair that with um, Samithra from the Alliance. And um, so the goal of that CTAC subcommittee or working group, I forget which it's called, um, will be to try to get all of the groups um, are involved to get um, a more pared down version of uh, required data elements for non-IND studies. So I think, um, again, this kudos to your survey. And um, I know this was brought up to that subcommittee as well. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to, to join your meeting tonight. So we have just a couple minutes for some questions or discussion. I don't know if anyone has anything you'd like to bring up or comments to make while well, we have Andrea on the phone and Jen here. You're just so overwhelmed by it all. I know we have been. Well, you're being quiet. I do just want to say thank you to everybody who did take the time to respond to the survey because um, without that, you know, we really wouldn't have been able to move anywhere with any of these things. So thank you. Well, if you do have questions, comments, additional insights, additional requests, feel free to reach out to Jen or I, and we'll have our, our contact information and certainly anyone that you know on the research operations work group. I would like to thank you, Jen, for all your hard work. Jen has been the glue in this whole thing. She's kept our committee on track and held meetings and made sure we pointed in the right direction and at least said, how are we doing? And then Andrea, oh my goodness, Andrea, thank you for being our cheerleader and our voice at NCI. You have absolutely been the the star of the show and helping us make sure that our voices got heard and these requests came forward in a way that has been impactful and also actionable. So thank you both wow. for your presentation tonight and for helping move this forward. And thank you all, really. If it weren't for all the commitment that you have, 
um, we really wouldn't be moving things along. So really thanks to, goes to all of you and to Connie and Jen for your leadership. Thank you. All right, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Our next presenter is Kay, Kay Tetmeyer, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, but I love Kay. She can tell us how to pronounce her name more officially, but she is one of the most practical people that you'll ever hear about managing specimens. So I've asked her to come and tell us the story of what happens when our, when our specimens arrive at Nationwide Children's. Give us some suggestions from a programmatic perspective on how we can make sure that these sacred treasures from our patients get handled properly and completely and get added to the banks so that, that they need to be in. So Kay, welcome to Site Operations. And Swag, you've been very busy. I think you're speaking a thousand times while you're here, right? Well, um, officially a presentation, only only this one, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is like really tall and I'm short, so I'm sorry if you can't see me. Um, I am, this is the first time, um, thank you. I have been, um, or the bank has presented at this meeting and I'm really excited to have this opportunity um, to start this collaboration with um, the ORP or COOP, CRP or whatever you want to call yourself. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I look forward to this and I, I understand probably in, in a group setting, it might be weird um, to ask questions or provide feedback. Um, and I will just put a little plug in that the bank has um, an open uh, forum table tomorrow. So if you want to stop by, we'll, we'll have candy um, and <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little incentive. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, Connie has been wonderful um, working with her um, just uh, over the years and, and providing feedback for what things are difficult for sites. So I just, I really look forward to this opportunity and, and speaking with you tonight. So really quickly, I'll go through um, an overview of who we are. So the SWOG Biospecimen Bank is located at the uh, Bio <laughs> Biopathology Center. I don't know where I work. Um, and we receive, uh, so that's located at the Abigail Wetzner Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. So if you're in um, the Pacific time zone and you're, you're contacting us at 3 p.m., your question's probably gonna get answered tomorrow. Um, and I, we're flagging a little bit, you know, we're th with the time change, so um, bear with me. <laughs> um, and so we, we buy a specimen bank for several um, other uh, cancer cooperative groups that you uh, may be aware of. The Children's Oncology Group, um, Energy Oncology Columbus, we make uh, primarily the gynecologic on uh, oncology specimens for energy. Um, the NCI um, EET, which includes ETCTN. Um, for those of you who are familiar with that, as well as some other smaller foundation trials like GOG Foundation, SARC, and Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And we are an accredited biorepository and laboratory. And I bring this up because the um, some of the policies and procedures that we have really dictate a lot of, uh, are based on the requirements for being an accredited laboratory. So sometimes, um, and some of the things that I will get into of you know why we're so specific, it's because of these accreditation requirements. So for um, specimen receipt at um, the Biopathology Center, across all of the groups that we serve, we can receive about 100 to 160 packages a day, and that can include up to 1,000 specimens. Um, for SWA, we mostly receive FFPE tissue, blocks, slides, um, occasionally scrolls or curls, uh, fresh blood, bone marrow, urine, and stool, everyone's favorite, um, frozen specimen uh, processed blood products, um, so plasma, serum, buffy coat, or urine that you guys have processed and frozen there and then shipped to us. Uh, also frozen tissue, fairly rarely, and then new with the um, iMatch pilot, um, tissue and floating in formalin. We accept all specimens uh, Monday through Friday and are open uh, Saturday for fresh blood and bone marrow processing. And so getting to the meat of sort of why I'm here, um, for some of the, the SWOG submissions for all the specimens that we, we receive, um, we have about 30% of submissions and that's defined as patients um, received per day, regardless of the number of packages. We have about 30% of those have one or more issues. So that is about 1,700 um, submissions per year or about 11,000 specimens per year. And each one of those requires us to contact you either a, a phone call, email, and or query and to receive a response um, so that we can move those specimens forward. 
And so the most common issues I'll be talking about today are, are labeling issues and quantity discrepancies. Um, we'll have a little bit of additional guidelines for dry ice um, requirements. In the past um, six months or so, we've seen an increase of specimens that have um, were shipped with inadequate amounts of dry ice. Um, but that's too boring to go into today. So, um, and the the key takeaway for most of this presentation is without the required information, these specimens may not be usable for the downstream research. So all of the effort that you have put in um, consenting patients, collecting the samples, packaging the samples, getting the data entered, all of that may not and those specimens may not even be able to be used for research if we're missing key details. So, um, and just sort of to uh, continue some of the conversation, protocols have gotten like immensely complex. I oversee one of uh, the groups that uh, onboards protocols for the biospecimen bank. And I, I know that's just a small portion of all of the protocol um, shenanigans you guys <laughs> have to do into onboard protocols. And um, they're inc incredibly complex, you know, for our team. So I can only imagine what that looks like at your site. And um, but because of that, you know, we have seen the error um, rate increase over the years. And so we just want to make sure that we're having this conversation. So some general guidelines um, for the next couple of slides that they're kind of content heavy. Um, and some of this is because, you know, as Connie said, you know, you'll get the slides after. Um, so hopefully these can be used as um, a resource or a starting point for a resource. Um, so labeling requirements, um, all of the specimens require a patient ID um, and uh, patient initials. And we recommend the format last comma first middle so that it's really clear um, what that order is. Um, sometimes we see um, you know, last comma, first middle on the specimen uh, packing list, but then on the, the specimen label it doesn't have a comma, so we can't assume that you've intended a comma there um, or that that order is, is supposed to be the same if it doesn't have the comma. And then also um, the date of specimen collection. So sometimes for tissue, especially if you have um, like a cons uh, consulting uh, pathology group that you're working with, they will enter that as this, the date that they received the sample, which is not necessarily the date that it was collected from the patient. So you wanna make sure that that collection date matches the date that it was collected from the patient. Um, less of an issue with blood or urine, we usually get those correct, but it's the, it's the tissue that can be sometimes confusing. And then um, the specimen type. So, you know, what, what is it? This is especially important for things that are visually similar. So if you're collecting and, and sending us plasma and serum, making sure that the label specifies where that came from um, can be really important for the downstream research. And then for uh, FFPE tissue, there are additional requirements that um, are correlate to the corresponding pathology report. So that's the pathology report that was generated um, from that same specimen collection procedure. Um, and that is the surgical pathology ID, um, SPID or, or session number, sometimes it's called on the pathology report and the block number. And I'll go into a little bit about that in a minute. And then other requirements can include uh, bone marrow laterality. So right or left, you don't have to write the whole word. You can just write RL and we'll extrapolate that part. Um, or and other protocol specific requirements like collection time. Um, this is mostly common for like PK samples where you are collecting um, multiple samples you know, together at, at one time point. Um, and tissue type, um, primary metastatic or normal, and I'll go into that in a minute too, um, and tissue slide thickness. And that's really important for um, uh, a few studies where you are collecting uh, slides with multiple thicknesses. So you might have some 10 micron that are used for extraction and they're not very good for staining. And you might have some four or five micron that are good for staining. So we wanna be able to, to differentiate those so that they're sent for the right downstream research. Um, so next slide. Um, so pathology reports and tissue types. Um, so the pathology reports are required for all formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues. So again, that's the block slides, scrolls, or sometimes people call those curls. Um, and that should be labeled with the SWOG uh, patient ID. Um, most people just handwrite that and it's perfectly fine. Some people are fancy and print out a little label with a you know, typed um, specimen or patient ID and that's great too. Um, but please do not redact the initials, SPID, 
or collection date. And if you remember, those are some of the labeling requirements. So we use that pathology report to correlate and make sure that we got the right specimen um, and that path, the, that path report goes with that specimen. And then um, the pathology reports are important because um, a biobank pathologist uses them to perform a quality control review. So, um, you know, they are looking for concordance with the institutional diagnosis. And if they don't have the full institutional diagnosis from that path report, then we can't confirm concordance. Um, so that's why, you know, those path reports are really important. And the, we have a, I provided the definitions, the biobank definitions of primary metastatic and normal. And if you go to your pathologist, they will probably disagree with some or uh, aspects of these. <laughs> so, um, but this, this is what we will call and, and ask questions if, if they don't, um, the pathology report doesn't align with these like PM or N um, on the specimen um, track, tracking packing list. So primary we're defining um, as the initial source of tumor tissue. So that, um, and that includes residual tumor tissue from the primary site. Um, and so it must make biological sense uh, for the tumor type. So we would not expect to find colon cancer and you know skin or something like that. Um, uh, metastatic tissue is tissue collected at, at the sites separate from the primary lesion. And that includes local and distant. So um, metastatic tumor, because. Um, sometimes that causes confusion because of some of the terminology in the packing list. Um, and that also includes residual tumor from the metastatic site. So this would be like a lung biopsy for prostate cancer. And then lastly, normal is tissue that does not contain tumor, um, like lymph nodes that specify that they do not contain tumor or um, controversially, um, you talk to a pathologist, um, like margins. So if margins are negative for tumor, then we would consider those normal tissue. Um, some SpecTrack tips. Um, so all specimens from the biobank must be logged into SpecTrack. I know that's probably um, a new concept, <laughs> um, but we have had a, a, an uptake of um, uh, specimens that haven't been logged into SpecTrack that we receive with some uh, institutional transmittal. So we just wanna you know, take this time to, to reiterate, reiterate that. Um, and then a printed copy of the SpecTrack packing list must be included in all shipments. Um, and then, so quantity um, is defined as the physical number of specimens in that category. So sometimes we see stained and unstained slides kind of grouped together. So if you have two H and E stained slides and 10 unstained slides, um, those should be listed as 10 and two. Um, and not 12 unstained slides or, or you know, 12 stained slides, because we will call you and, and clarify and make sure. Um, and then liquid specimens, you want to count the number of uh, vials or tubes and not volume. So if you have two 10 mil EDTA tubes, that's two. Um, and nine. Um, and uh, the example label on the, the packing list um, is provided as a reminder of what specimen labels should look like. Some people have been very creative and have um, cut those out and then um, taped them onto the, the specimen. Um, we want you to use the address label templates on um, the website or um, you can create your own templates with, with the required information. Um, and then lastly, um, a few resources. So the, the SWAG Biospecimen Processing and Submission Procedures website, a long title. Um, so you can access that through the CRA workbench, but honestly, I just, I Google it. And if you do SWAG Biospecimen, it's like the first or second link. <laughs> Sometimes that might be easier to navigate. Um, that includes the general specimen processing instructions, um, packing uh, guidelines, labeling requirements, and the label templates. Um, but again, also, you know, just, uh, refer to the protocol if um, you uh, if there are specific requirements listed in the protocol, then you want to make sure that you're following those. And then again, the packing list includes the laboratory address. So um, sometimes we get a panic call. I need to ship to the biobank and I don't know where to ship it to. Um, if you um, enter that into the spectra packing list, um, the, the address and contact information is on there. And then very lastly, um, I like again, I just I want to reiterate, um, I, I really hope that this hope helps to open the conversation um, between you guys and the biobank. Um, what resources can we provide 
Um, you know, I, I, I love working with all the folks at SWOG um, because I feel like there's a, a very um, education focused uh, uh, education focus on um, making sure people have the tools and resources to do your jobs um, e efficiently and effectively. And I just wanna um, reiterate that the bank wants to be part of that. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Well, thank you, Kay. You can see how much Kay pours her heart into this. She's very passionate and I've just gained enormous respect for you and all that you do to protect these specimens that we send. It's a little sobering when we hear the numbers of how many are missing, just that one thing that could get in the way of making them applicable to the studies that we do. So thank you, Kay, for all you do to make sure that our work does matter and that what our patients give us contributes to what they hope and pray that it will. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Do be sure to catch her at the open forum tomorrow, and not just because of the candy at the table, but really fun to talk to her, but very practical. And if for those of you in leadership at your sites, the reason we also wanted to include this is so that you could take home the slides to teach your teams, and also she'll have additional resources tomorrow for teaching that you can share as you're onboarding so many new staff. The specimen area is a complex specialty area of what we do, and it's so critically important. So thank you, everybody. All right, next up we have from the group chair's office, I believe Kyle and Pat. Here comes Pat and here's Kyle. Yeah, so uh, Pat and I are from the group chair's office, and we just have a couple slides. We don't have too much this time. Uh, we'll keep it pretty condensed, but we'll start with uh, what we're doing tomorrow at the ORP Open Forum. We haven't, it's been a couple of years. It's been kind of nostalgic to be back in San Francisco uh, and to have kind of the speed dating tables that ORP Open Forum offers. So uh, we will have uh, representatives tomorrow. Uh, it's from 1 to 2.30. It is at the Pacific LO. Um, and we'll have multiple members of the funding team there discussing a variety of topics, um, funding memo, funding memos on national coverage analysis, uh, and then a variety of things related to, to site payments, both federal and non-federal. Uh, and then this is kind of the final or one of the final slides. Uh, it's a goodbye, but it's way more of a thank you. Uh, after six wonderful years, this is my last week at SWOG. Uh, I've gotten to know a lot of people in here, and you'd all do really, really amazing work. Uh, since I joined SWOG six years ago, my mom and my mother-in-law have had three different boats with cancer, and it's, as you all know, very scary, um, but it's been really cool for my family and my wife's family just to know that there are amazing people, like all of you in here, that are doing really cool stuff and incredible work, so... It's been a pleasure being online friends and colleagues with all of you, um, but we will have great support. Pat has, is amazing as a grants manager and they will find a better replacement than me. Uh, and they will continue to answer all your questions and make sure all your funds on the federal side are delivered and your financial agreements are in place. Um, but yes, again, just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, that has become a good colleague. And then one more slide. Yeah. I'll... Oh, you got this one? Okay. okay. Now I'll tell you who to email. So um, thank you, and you're going to be sorely missed. Um, so we're going to um, be trying to find a new grants and contracts coordinator. And um, it is my intention that uh, site payments will continue as normal. But until we can find a new grants and contracts coordinator, just please be patient with us. Um, and on that note, we have uh, some new contact um, emails. So um, any emails that you would normally send to Kyle, you can send to uh, fedsitepayments at swag.org. Um, I will be monitoring this email. Um, and then when we have a new grants and contracts coordinator, um, they will be, and I will be, so somebody will be able to get back to you regardless of who's on vacation or anything of that sort. Um, we also have a distribution list for our non-federal site payments as well, finance at the, um, the Hope Foundation.org. So this is uh, Debbie and, and her team and Marcy. 
Mariela. Um, and then, of course, if you have any general questions, if you need um, information on the national coverage analysis, or you just don't know who to contact, funding at swag.org for um, any of your questions. Is there, is there any questions, comments? No? Okay. Thank well, you. I just want to acknowledge both of you. Um, Pat, thanks for staying and being steadfast. And Kyle, thank you so, so, so much for your service over these years. I think just about everybody in this room who's an operations site leader is going to echo that sentiment. You've made things very simple, very clear, and we've been able to figure out what the heck we're trying to do. So thank yeah. you so, so much, and we're going to miss you. All right, next we have Dana Sparks. Andrea alluded to some of the work that Dana has been doing, but we're especially glad to hear from you, Dana, about what you're working on. For our tech guys in the back, can Dana speak from a floor mic? Is that okay? So I don't have very much to share, but I did want to share a few things. Um, some of you are probably already aware that we've had some general movements and promotions in the protocol department over the last six months or so. Um, and I did want to generally acknowledge Crystal Miwa is now the protocol department manager and she's doing a great job and actually had been doing most of the job for a lot longer. <laughs> um, and then both Mariah Norman and Laura Gildner have been promoted to um, program manager positions. So they're supervising the other project managers in the protocol department. And um, Mariah has just relatively recently returned from maternity leave. So she, she came back to a promotion, um, but they, they both jumped in and they're doing a wonderful job. So if you have questions that are more programmatic and not protocol specific or disease site specific, they're great resources for you just in terms of protocols, protocol language, protocol development. Um, Secondly, I am going to be working with Andrea and, and people from all of the other cooperative groups on the um, decentralizing protocols. Now, I, I'm trying to get used to that term because we kept calling it flexibility initiatives. And the NCI and FDA have gone in the direction of talking about decentralization. But basically, it's allowing sites to have more choice in terms of their internal processes and allowing data to come from um, patients' healthcare providers and allowing for remote consent and allowing for telehealth visits and things like that. So I expect, I, I really am hoping that the whole process is going to move very quickly. And I think that you'll start to see some of that language in protocols probably within the next year easily. I'm hoping that this working group works quickly and, and maybe even within the next six months, we'll have something that's real. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And then finally, I just wanted to quickly recognize Connie Barnes. She does not want me to recognize her, but this spring represents her 35th anniversary officially with SWAG. <laughs> And that was as of her official hire date. She actually came to SWAG as a temporary employee. So she's actually been with us longer, but 35 years as far as her official hire date. So, awesome. and I think all of you know how amazing Connie has been over all of these years in supporting the membership department. So I don't have to be the cheerleader for that, but I want to be. So I appreciate your appreciation of Connie. Thank you, Dana. I just wanted to also acknowledge, Dana, you didn't say a lot about it, but the work that you're doing to make sure that when you work with this working group to develop some new super duper guidelines and practical applications, you took a, a tact that was very near and dear to the hearts of Jen and I and the ROI work group to see what we can do as a cross group collaboration so that won't be SWAG doing one thing, Alliance doing another, ECOG doing a third, Energy something else that 
how we together, all of us collectively can make the world a better place. So thank you very much for your leadership in that regard. It's really special, appreciate it. All right, next up, Rodney, Rodney Suter, that many of you know, especially if you got up early today for the clinical trials training course, he's just faithfully led this for years and done such a fabulous job. And he's the program director of therapeutic studies over at the SWAG SDMC. So Rodney, here's your um, flipper deal. Oh, okay. Thank you, Connie. Yeah, it's been an early, long day. So <laughs> those of you that are at the training course thought it was too cool. It must be very comfortable in here because it's really hot. Okay, so I want to start out by uh, looking at a few, well, a handful of studies that we uh, activated in the first quarter of the year. Um, Dr. Blinky sent a frontline uh, article out about this, but got a number of these that we have activated and worked hard on within SWOG. There's a lung map, lung map sub-study, S1900G, uh, S2205 in prevention, or called ICE Compass, Compress, I'm sorry. Uh, Pragmatica, everybody's heard about that, S2302. Uh, the first combo match phase two study, EAY 191-S3, and then uh, S2114 in lymphoma and S2010 in breast. Um, a lot of effort went into these at the operations office, at the SDMC, with the statisticians, the data coordinators, the study builders, um, group chairs. I mean, it, it basically encompassed a lot of time. So I just want to get a little plug for all the work that went into that. And then just to remind you guys to please activate and enroll on these trials. Um, I want to talk about S1826. It's a phase three lymphoma study. Uh, the data is going to the FDA. It's not officially an FDA trial, but it's going to be sent for post-marketing analysis. Um, they are looking to send an amendment out uh, requesting uh, uploaded images for two additional time points. Um, the effort going into this, we're again going to contract with a CRO called Advance um, to assist us with identifying the best contacts to work with you at the sites, um, assist in getting the image uh, submission and query re resolution done, um, resolving missing data elements on existing CRFs, and updating uh, the DTLs. Uh, no additional data is going to be asked for outside of those two uh, images at those two time points, uh, but you can expect an increase in queries if the study is reviewed, and uh, you can look for an upcoming funding memo that will be related to that effort. Uh, as everybody knows, we have a monthly uh, expectation and IPR report that gets posted on the CRA workbench on the second of each month. And... Uh, a little bit ago, we had um, a few suggestions by CRAs saying, you know, it's it's good that we get these warning messages or that we see where we're run, falling short, but we kind of like a place to look to see if partway through the month, are we um, getting out of the red? Are we still in trouble? Um, or are we on course? So we uh, published um, this, I think, last month. And so you may have already noticed it, but um, if you go to the CRA workbench to pull up your report, you'll, sit, you'll notice on the right, there are the monthly IPR reports and the mid-month IPR reports. If you want to take a look, those are refreshed on the 15th of the month. Um, we're not sending out any letters or anything related to that. It's just for your own use to see if you're getting, uh, getting closer to where your goal is by the next month. Okay, ID me. Uh, I'm just curious, show of hands, how many have already gone through the process and updated this? Okay, how many are thankful that they did it already? Oh, I was not in that boat. So I figured I should talk about this because at the time when I made this slide, I thought that these were going to be uh, due by, I think, June, and they extended it to January 1st. So if you haven't done it, you still have some time. Um, I'm not going to go through all these uh, uh, bullet points, but here is what you're going to need to do. It's not a real quick and easy process. It takes a little bit more time. Um, it, it, it's going to take more time if you access the sites uh, multiple times through the day, but um, just a reminder to process that before uh, the end of the year. Uh, in previous meetings, um, we've talked about a pilot project we've done uh, for EHR to EDC, um, electronic health record to electronic data capture. Um, the goal of this was for, to reduce data entry time and cost for you and improved data quality overall. Uh, the pilot was completed in May of 20, 2022. 
Uh, NCART is now live. More SWAG sites are signed on and more are coming and NCART is free for SWAG trials. Um, there's a quote here from uh, Nicole Mahaffey at UC Davis as far as her experience using NCART. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about this pilot project, if you want to participate, or if you're currently at a site that is participating and you have feedback or questions of how it works, um, there is going to there is a table that's already set up. It's uh, just to the left down the, down the wave of the SWAG main group meeting registration desk. Um, or if you want to contact the group by email, you can email this link here: swag-ehr-edc at crab.org. Got a few new staff members in our office. Uh, the two on the left, Pasarle and Alex, uh, have joined the data management team in therapeutics. Uh, Pasarle is uh, joining lung, lung and myeloma, and Alex joined lymphoma. And then uh, Jamie Sundstrom, which I think is in the room here, is our new recruitment and adherence specialist that just started a few months ago as well. Uh, CRE Workbench, I, I, I brought this up during the training course this morning. Uh, the reason why you keep seeing slides about the CRA workbench at multiple meetings and, and the training course and uh, uh, probably online too um, and in the uh, CRA newsletter is uh, we take, you know, we're still going out to sites, mentoring them, and uh, the data coordinators get questions still every day on email and phone, and we refer them to the CRA workbench for things and surprisingly find out that a lot of people don't even know that it existed or what the resources were. And uh, a lot of work's gone into uh, to build and maintain this. So again, if you didn't know about the workbench, uh, you can get there through the member resources page on uh, the SWAG website. And then once you log in, you'll see some announcements about things that are, that are new or that we've been pushing through, um, a number of links on the left. And then my last slide is just to give another plug about the CRA newsletter. We just published the spring edition uh, in April. And it has uh, items like training opportunities, importance of follow-up, PMB inventory management system, uh, some updates to the expectation report, uh, SWAG site mentoring, among a few other things. Again, if you have ideas for this newsletter, um, articles that you'd like to write or like us to write to provide, provide more information to you, please email the CRA newsletter at crab.org link there. And that's all I had. If anybody has any questions, I can take those. One question, Rodney. Sure. S eighteen twenty six. What's the timeline for that with um this prep for FDA submission? I there's no timeline yet. Yeah, I, I was gonna say if Kathy was here, she probably might know, but um, I'd expect later this year. Yeah, we'll find okay. out for you. All right, we're not in a hurry. Just in case you were wondering. Well, I, I think if it's happening right away, then I'd probably have a better answer for that, but. Yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you, Rodney. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Laura Gonzalez, our quality assurance manager. Welcome, Laura. Okay. Hi, y'all. I'm Laura Gonzalez from the operations office. I'm the quality assurance manager. Just like to say thank you to everyone that's here tonight. And so I just have a few little things to tell you all about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is protocol deviations. Just want to remind everybody that QA and SWOG follows the CIRB guidance for reportable protocol deviations. So it's got to be potentially an unanticipated problem, continuous or serious noncompliance. So you can go to this link here that'll run you through kind of the algorithm for whether or not you need to report it. Now, if you're using a local IRB or if your local IRB has some extra reporting requirements, you might have to do that. But as far as we're concerned, if the NCI says you need to report it, then we adhere to the same thing, okay? We have some record retention guidance so that you know what you need to keep in terms of IRB and research records. And again, this link will get you to where we have that document on the SWAG website. 
So the report, the list of protocols with no required follow-up is available on the CRA workbench, as Rodney talked about. And what that list gives is the date when all the DHHS and FDA record retention requirements have been met group-wide, okay? So we do all the work for you. If it's on that list, then those records can be destroyed according to HIPAA requirements. Okay, so all you have to do is type that in, type that protocol in or look on that list on the CRA workbench and it will tell you when those records can be destroyed. And that's something that we work on continuously, updating and making sure that those protocols get added to that list as, as it becomes appropriate. So just so you know, that's how, how you can double check. The next thing we are super excited about, education, education, education. We are going to start some live webinar series. So Maggie, my assistant manager, and Rosie Ermite, one of our um, QA nurse auditors, are going to start the first one that's going to be, it's going to be quarterly. So the first one that we're going to do is in July. Right now, I don't think we've settled on a topic yet. We're kind of still batting some ideas around. But um, the first one, like I said, is going to be July 25th and July 27th. You can contact Maggie um, to get some more information. You can always hit, hit us up at qamail at swag.org. That will um, we'll get you an answer for everything. Anything that you need to know, qamail at swag.org. That's how you can get your answers. If I don't know it, if Maggie doesn't know it, we will put it out in the swagosphere. We will get back to you and someone will get you an answer. So does anybody have any questions? Well, if you think of something, QA mail at swag.org. We have a, a comment from Kathy Rankin on the chat uh, for S1826. Data queries have already increased and they'll be working on cleaning the data for publication soon. So please keep up on the queries that are posted by the data coordinators. All right, so we're rolling into almost our grand finale here and it's really grand. I'm so excited about our next segment of this meeting. We call it Thoughts on Life and um, kudos to Caitlin for developing this session. She and Toby Sample together are gonna to share with you some information and a story, a personal, very personal story about why we all get out of bed every day and the difference that our work makes. So take it away, Caitlin. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone for being here uh, toward the end of the night. I promise this is going to be worth it. Um, I want to give you a little background on Toby. Uh, and it all comes back to SWAG. And a few years ago, when I came to my first SWAG meeting and uh, was privileged to meet many of you, I also sat in on a talk by Dr. Dazan, who hopefully is here this year. I'm not sure. Uh, he is a champion of utilizing social media to really um, reach out to our patient population and engage and spoke to the importance of utilizing social media and really the power of it. And it really spoke to me. Um, I don't have a huge social media footprint, but he encouraged me and I went home and got on Twitter and started observing all that is med Twitter and sometimes, you know, not such great stuff, but along the way, a handful of months ago, I was at the playground with my children and busy on Twitter, not being a great parent. Oops. And st I stumbled upon a ER physician's thread about his wife's journey through cancer and his advocacy for her and found myself crying at the playground on the weekend. And so I, on a lark, decided to shoot him a direct message or a DM and thought nothing of it until a few weeks later, I got an email from his wife, Toby, and she was interested in sharing her story with us. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Toby. Uh, she is an amazingly resilient woman and has been extremely gracious of her time to come here tonight. And um, I'm just in awe of her and I suspect you will be as well. Oops. 
Go ahead, Toby. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. That, um, that story, that introduction is so funny because when we were sitting in the basement, my husband said, oh my gosh, I just got a DM from a lady that wants you to come speak. And I was like, me to come speak. And so, um, it's, a uh, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, and I just, I thank you for reaching out and letting me share my story. Um, but this slide was me and this was my life before cancer. I was first diagnosed with stage two melanoma in 2008. And I remember not fully understanding what melanoma was or how devastating of a disease it can be. I remember getting a little bit of a reality check when my dermatologist referred me to a surgical oncologist followed by a medical oncologist. And I remember thinking, what oncologist? People who have cancer see oncologists. And then I quickly realized that I had become a cancer patient. Um, and at that time, there was little research and few therapies available to help melanoma patients. I had a wide local excision to remove the cancer, a chest x-ray and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. I was diagnosed with stage 2B melanoma. My lymph nodes were clear, so surgery was all that I needed at that time, followed by, of course, regular visits with my dermatologist and surgical oncologist. And after searching Dr. Google, I was relieved after reading the statistics about the different stages of melanoma. And I remember saying, at least I don't have stage four melanoma because that would have been a death sentence. And I was told I was free to continue on with life, and that's exactly what I did. At the time, my husband was a physician in the Air Force, and we were stationed at RAF Lake and Heath in England. And during the three and a half years that we lived overseas, we were able to experience life as we've never experienced it before. We were able to travel and visit over 13 different countries, and some of them will be shown up on the screen. Um, but we were able to show the world to our daughters, and it was just such a wonderful time for us. And while I was stationed there, I was still being seen by a dermatologist and a surgical oncologist. And there were a few, few suspicious areas um, that were removed and biopsied. Thankfully, they were all benign. So we continued on with life as we knew it. When our overseas tour was complete, it was time to plant our roots back on American soil. And we really felt like the world was ours. Steve was no longer in active duty. So we could literally move anywhere we chose to live. So in January of 2013, we decided to move back to good old Indiana so we could be closer to family. We had been away for nearly nine years, so it was time to come back home. And it was just five short months later, a new lesion appeared on my right chest wall near my shoulder. And you'll see this picture, which I nicknamed the Big Red Grape. It was concerning, so I called for an appointment, and the area was biopsied, and at this time, I did not hear the wonderful word benign. It was malignant melanoma, and this time, the fight was going to be much more intense. In fact, it wasn't even a fight. It was an all-out war. I remember feeling numb after hearing this news over the phone, but my mind was racing, and I was just thinking, no, there's no way this can't be, this can't be happening. I have so much left to do. And on that day, I began my ongoing argument with cancer. I kept thinking my girls need their mother. I want to see them grow up, get their driver's license, go to prom, graduate from high school, see them off to college, watch them fall in love and be there for them when their hearts get broken, watch them get married and start their own families. I thought they are too young to have to deal with this. They need me. So I began writing letters to their future selves. I was so worried they were gonna forget who their mom was. I needed them to remember me and to know that I would always be there with them in spirit, if not in flesh. I labeled the letters for all of the big, big events that I uh, mentioned above and tucked them away. Luckily, They've never had to see the letters and they've been burned, but um, it was then I kind of started thinking about my husband, Steve, and I, I worried about how he was going to handle all of this. We had just moved to a new city. He had just started a new and stressful job in the ER. 
Steve had also remained in the Air National Guard, which though that had commitments that he had to follow. So I worried about how my illness would then add to his stress load. And my worries expanded to include my broader circle of family, my mom, my dad, stepmom, in-laws, siblings, and friends. I began to see what a toll this was going to take on everyone. See, this diagnosis didn't just change my life, it changed the lives of everyone that I knew and cared about. So that day I cried. I cried so hard, I'm not even sure how there were tears still flowing, but I would go into the shower because I knew my girls wouldn't be able to see me crying in there and I took lots of showers. I remember the worst gut-wrenching, heavy-hearted feeling that came after hearing the news, and I was just devastated. So I made an appointment to see a melanoma specialist, Dr. Miller, at the University of Louisville Brown Cancer Center. However, I didn't make it to that appointment. You see, I had no idea how or where my melanoma had spread, and I was staying with my sister the night before my scheduled appointment with Dr. Miller. And I had been complaining about back pain, but thought it was a result of me working out with a personal trainer. But that night I woke up in the middle of the night in an all out pain crisis. The tumors were exploding into my spine. I woke my sister and we headed towards the University of Louisville emergency room. However, I couldn't make it that far as I passed out in the car from the severity of the pain. We diverted to a closer hospital and I had testing done, was given a large amount of pain medication, and then transferred to University of Louisville, where I then received more pain medication. My husband was contacted, and when he heard what was happening, he left work and rushed to the hospital. And fortunately for me, he found me unresponsive in respiratory arrest in the UofL hospital bed. The pain meds from both hospitals combined to give me an overdose. And just one minute later might have just been too late. During this hospital stay is when I learned that the melanoma had spread to multiple areas of my spine, sacrum, clavicle, humerus, rib, and lung, stage four metastatic melanoma. My worst nightmare had come true almost five years to the day of my original melanoma diagnosis in 2008. My prognosis was very poor and I was devastated again. I was discharged from the hospital and told to return to see Dr. Miller to discuss what treatment options would be best for me. Radiation for pain control would be one of them. But I'm here to tell you that I'm both lucky and blessed. I'm lucky that this stage four diagnosis didn't happen in 2008. Treatment options were extremely limited in my, with my original stage two diagnosis. If you were given a stage four melanoma diagnosis prior to 2013, your chances for survival for more than a few months were very low. Melanoma research has come so far in just a few short years, and I'm so, so very thankful for that. They tested my tumor for the BRAF mutation. My oncologist explained to me the difference between positive and negative mutation results, and we were very hopeful for it to be positive which he expected actually due to me being young and otherwise healthy. This result would allow me to receive many more treatment options, extending life by approximately 11 months. Now, 11 months might not seem very long to some of you, but this is 11 months of extra time for researchers to find other treatment options that I could explore when this one stopped working. But my mutation was negative and that was another heartbreaking news. And not realizing that I was both lucky and blessed, depression was starting to set in. Thankfully, the FDA had approved a newer type of immunotherapy called Yervoy in 2011. And it was decided that I would try this treatment, which consisted of four infusions. But after the third infusion, my tumor quadrupled in size and it was determined that I wasn't responding. So that treatment was discontinued, and I really honestly felt like my time was just ticking away. I spent the majority of that summer in bed on home oxygen as a result of the large amount of pain medication needed to keep my pain at bay. I had always been a very active person, 
running half marathons, playing sports, being outside, and really just enjoying life. So this was something very unusual for myself and anyone else to, that knew me to witness. I was losing hope and fearing the worst, rightfully so. Actually, hospice was almost called at this point. And my husband at that time had just been researching anything he could get his hands on, trying to find something that would turn the corner for me. I remember him coming into the bedroom so excited to tell me about a clinical trial he had read about. It had promising data with few side effects, and he desperately wanted to find a site that would accept me. He received a list of all the clinical trial sites that offered this new anti-PD-1 mystery drug that he knew I had to get some way, somehow. So he began emailing every trial site and my sister began placing calls to every clinical trial coordinator, begging them to return her call. Out of the sites that she contacted, one site called back, UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina, go Tar Heels. I had to find enough energy to take phone calls, talk to staff, and ultimately talk with Dr. Moskus. And I'll tell you, when you are using every amount of energy that you have to stay alive, it is really, really hard to talk to people on the phone. But after speaking with all of the people involved, Dr. Mox, Dr. Moskus decided to give me the opportunity to meet with him and ultimately join the trial. Turns out we were on a very big time crunch as the trial enrollment was closing at 5 p.m. that same day. They were in North Carolina and I was nine hours away in Indiana, so I couldn't just run down the street and sign documents and consents, but things worked out and I was able to receive the consents, look them over, agree to the trial conditions, sign and return them at 4.59 p.m. I was the last person enrolled in the trial nationwide. One minute later, and it would have been too late for me, one minute, just 60 seconds, sometimes makes all the difference. The clinical trial nurse that responded said that there was, quote, something in my sister's voice that she knew she had to call back and get me into that trial. I will be forever indebted to Victoria, who I also call my angel on earth. So I made the nine hour trip for the initial visit and with some hesitation, Dr. Dr. Moskus agreed to allow me into the trial, but I had to guarantee that I would make the trip every three weeks as needed to stay in the trial for an indefinite period of time. I received that news on my 40th birthday and it was a very, very great birthday present. This would be yet another hardship on the family though, not just financially, but emotionally and physically. My family had their life turned upside down. Every three weeks I had to leave and fly to North Carolina and someone had to come and stay at our house with our girls. Someone also had to accompany me to North Carolina with every visit. My family's normal was far from what we were used to. And I realized once again, that cancer affects everyone, not just the patient. But, and here's the miracle. I began seeing improvement in my skin lesion after the first dose of the anti-PD-1 drug and I experienced minimal side effects. Each six-week scan revealed that my tumors were shrinking or absent. I began feeling better, and this is me after my first cycle. Actually, I just finished walking a whole 5K. I took myself off of all the pain medications, fighting the effects of drug withdrawal. Not the smartest thing I've ever done, I will say, but I am a bit stubborn, I've been told and began living life again. And a huge breakthrough happened in September of 2014. The FDA approved the anti-PD-1 drug that I was receiving in North Carolina. And this was the news that I had been waiting for because it meant I could receive infusions at home. It meant no more car trips or plane rides, no more hotels, and maybe somewhat of a more normal life for me and my family. It also meant that others who were hopeless and fighting for their own lives had another treatment option that just might work for them. I was fortunate enough to be able to afford paying for the plane rides and the extra expenses it took for me to participate in the trial. But there are many others who are not able to afford those extra expenses and therefore 
They wait on the sidelines, just hoping and praying for the next approval. So I continued receiving Keytruda until 2017 when I made the decision to stop treatment after months and years of clear scans. And I really just had a peace of mind that it was time. So then now what? The last four years had revolved around medical visits, infusion treatments, and living scan to scan. So it was time to start living again. I was told I would never be able to run again due to the tumors that had weakened my spine, one in particular that was pressing on my spinal cord. I was told that I should not carry weight over 10 pounds with my right arm due to the tumor that had invaded my humerus. My bone could easily snap into just by brushing my hair, they say. So what I do? Well, I began running. I told you I was a little bit stubborn. <laughs> it was my joy in life pre-melanoma, and I really just wanted to do it again. So I signed up for the Nashville Half Marathon and recruited a few friends to run that with me. Was my doctor happy with that decision? Not even a little bit, but he was very proud when he learned that I finished the race. I wore my Mella Homies t-shirt that I made to honor the friends that I had made during my time sitting in the infusion chair. Some lost and some still fighting the battle. They were with me every step of the way. I began speaking to high school students about the dangers of tanning and the risk that sun exposure had on their chances of developing melanoma in the future. If it helps one of those students stay out of a tanning bed or begin applying sunscreen when they go outside, it is totally worth it. I'm also an advocate for melanoma research. I started a walk in the Louisville, Kentucky area with Aim at Melanoma to help raise funds for their melanoma tissue bank, not only to raise funds, but also to bring melanoma patients and their loved ones together to know they are not alone in this awful journey they are on. I am a registered nurse and I never really felt a calling to do oncology nursing until I was faced with cancer myself. So I applied at the cancer center where I once received treatment and began giving back to the oncology community by providing care for those in the battle. It was the best job with the best patients I've ever had and they really taught me so much more than I could have ever taught them. I'd like to think that I've made a difference in their lives as Victoria made in mine, showering them with love and hope. But most recently, I asked my oncologist, guess what I'm gonna do? And he responded, oh no, what now? And I said, well, I'm gonna hike Mount Kilimanjaro. And he said, chuckling, of course you are. And I made the difficult trek 19,000 341 feet up Mount Kilimanjaro, carrying a 25 pound backpack for eight days. This year I turned 50 and it also marks 10 years from my stage four diagnosis. It was time to do something extraordinary. With every step of that hike, I was reminded of everyone who had helped get me to this point in my life. My family, friends, doctors, nurses, my Mella homies, but most importantly, the clinical trial doctors, nurses, and staff. If they hadn't allowed me into their trial, I would not be here with you tonight sharing my story. You make a difference. What you do means life or death to those of us in the fight. The papers that are put in front of you are real living people with so much life left to live. There are people who are counting on the research to find a cure. There are people dying while they are waiting. I appreciate every one of you so much, and I'm sure it gets tiring. I'm sure there's never enough time in the day to do what needs to be done. And I'm sure there's an insane amount of pressure put on you either by yourselves, your patients, or your workplace. But please, if you don't hear anything else that I've said this evening, hear this. What you are doing matters. Without you, I wouldn't have seen my children reach their milestones. My oldest daughter, Haley, is now 25 years old. She graduated from Indiana University and currently lives in San Francisco, California, with her little dog, Willow, living her best life. My youngest daughter is 22 and just recently graduated from Indiana University this past weekend as well. She's applied to medical school. She's moving to Spain this fall to teach English and hopes to be in the oncology field herself one day. 
I've witnessed and been a part of these moments because of the work you are doing. I am forever grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you have and continue to do for the oncology community. And just remember one minute, just 60 seconds can make all the difference in someone's life. And I thank you again so much for having me here with you tonight. Toby, thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself with us. You're welcome. I do want to add just a couple of points to bring it back to SWOG. Um, Toby's oncologist at Louisville is actually a SWOG member and conducts SWOG trials. And we do have SWOG trials going right now that are continuing to hopefully improve the face of melanoma research. So we have S2000 enrolling and recruiting right now, as well as S2015, S2101, and the lauded uh, combo match, which is making a lot of appearances at the conference today and this week, EAY191. We also have some additional trials that are utilizing pembrolizumab, and um, S2001 is one of those, and S2302, the Pragmatica trial, is another. So um, I think it's really important to consider everything that Toby has said and that the work we do, the paper we push, the acronyms we learn, the time we spend in you know, conference centers, it does matter. And it's hard sometimes to see forests of the trees, but she is one of those. And we have many friends and patients around us who are relying on us to move this research forward. There's a lot of things to be thankful for, for sure. Toby, thank you for sharing. Thank all of our speakers for taking the time and being with us today. I want to thank Courtney for helping us with all the details of bringing us together tonight. Liz and Caitlin, thanks for your work on this meeting. And thanks to our executive committee for helping to guide and lead and steer what we do. I want to welcome Liz to our executive board now, as well as Aaron Sebula and thank Annette Betley, who's retired, and Seal Petrowski. We can't close this meeting without mentioning their names. I'm not even sure if you all are aware that they've gone off to pursue richer pastures and such, but keeping them in our thoughts and hearts as well. So I hope that your day one was wonderful, that this kicks off the most memorable SWAG meeting you've ever been at yet, <laughs> that you've found the best of new friends, met and seen some old colleagues that you haven't seen in years, thanks to our pandemic and whatever else has been going on in the world. So enjoy your SWAG meeting, mark your calendars for fall, and come back inspired and refreshed in the morning. We'll see you for the rest of SWAG. Thank you so very much.